Franklin at Sandia National Labs. I'm a, a member of the senior uh, senior member of the technical staff here, and uh, I'm excited to talk about energy storage options and really some key selection considerations uh, in this presentation today. So we're going to walk through the importance of energy storage, which I'm sure many of you are already well aware of, discuss some of the promising and, and commercialized technologies, and then go through some modeling work um, that we've done here at Sandia that really helps express the uh, influence that different system parameters have and how it makes some systems more suitable for your application space versus others. So um, to start off, of, of course, energy storage is going to be needed to achieve full decarbonization. Um, now, whether that, that, that pertains to both the power generation sector as well as uh, process heat, whether that be to be heating buildings or processes at high and low temperatures, we're going to need energy storage. Um, as a, a colleague, Jeremy Twitchell of PNNL has been quoted saying, energy storage is no longer a luxury, but it's a necessity. Um, and, and that's exactly the truth. So within the energy storage space, of course, there's shorter duration energy storage. Um, and uh, DOE likes to distinguish, Department of Energy likes to distinguish between shorter and longer duration storage. So Typically, that's around eight or more hours of storage. You know, of course, that number, it can be debatable, but that's typically what we think of. And that's eight hours of storage when dispatching your storage system at its maximum power capacity. So to meet some of the global and even U.S. decarbonization goals, there needs to be a, a significant amount of energy storage deployed on the power grid. Globally, to meet the 2040 decarbonization goals, uh, there needs to be about 85 to 140 terawatt hours of energy storage implemented. So um, it's, quite, it's quite the lift. Now, to do that, uh, we need to make sure it's economical. And so to do that, the first thing we can do is reduce the cost of the energy storage systems themselves so that when we pair them with the renewable system, it makes sense. And then very importantly, and within the theme of this presentation today, we need to make sure that the energy storage solution we select best meets the application space that it'll actually be deployed in. So there's a variety of technologies that are out there that are promising, and there's some promising technologies that are already commercially available. So I won't list them all, but a few worth noting are the traditional electrochemical uh, energy storage systems such as, you know, lithium ion batteries and lead acid batteries. Then there's the flow type battery where the commercially available systems are predominantly vanadium redox flow. And there are some other emerging uh, chemistries in that area. There's of course, compressed air energy storage, which it's important to distinguish whether that's in caverns or in above ground tanks, both of which are commercially available. Of course, in Alaska, I know pump storage hydro power is, uh, uh, is a big option because the geological features present themselves. And then there's other things like thermal energy storage, which we'll talk a little bit more about today, is that's where most of my research efforts are focused. Um, and then gravity energy storage. And then even to hydrogen storage, where no longer are we talking, you know, eight to 100 hours, but we start talking months to years of storage at a time where storing energy and chemical bonds becomes very relevant. Now, the point I wanna make here is that all of these different technologies have pros and cons and different technologies are gonna lend themselves better to different deployment applications. So whichever technology solution you choose is gonna be very scenario specific. And I hope to highlight today some of those key scenario parameters that need to be taken into consideration when selecting a system. So one way to help us understand uh, the parameters that affect technology selections is what I call 8760 modeling. So this is modeling energy storage systems using hourly data over a year. So this top figure kind of shows over five days, hourly resolved data showing both the energy uh, available from a clean energy system, as well as what the grid might be demanding. Um, you can do this sort of analysis with data acquired over one year. You can do it with data acquired over several years, 
or you can use data sets that are of a yearly resolution, but have been uh, put together using decades worth of data. So this sort of modeling approach really allows us to understand when we're going to charge our system and when the grid is, uh, when there's a generation deficit and when we need to discharge our battery to meet the grid demand. So at Sandia, we've developed um, a version of the 8760 modeling that's really intended at comparing energy storage systems, you'll see denoted as ESS, within the same environment. We want to compare apples to apples. And so when we do this, it allows us to really see impacts of different uh, you know, modeling or deployment parameters, where a few of them I'm going to highlight today are power purchase agreement, and more specifically, just looking at how we're costing electricity and if we're varying that costing throughout the day. Energy availability for charging, uh, really making sure that the power we want to dispatch our energy storage system is going to be compatible with how much energy is actually available to charge the system. And then, of course, system efficiency will really have a key impact, and we'll, we'll go through some of those in more detail. Now, I'm going to walk through a variety of modeling results today, and I don't want to get too caught up on all the background, uh, you know, uh, methods behind that. Uh, but there's a few peak parameters or a few key parameters that we're going to keep constant. And so one of the uh, model parameters here is that we're going to assess systems where there's a 100 megawatt peak uh, discharge power. Uh, and so in the worst case scenario, that's going to be when we have no generating assets online and we need to dispatch uh, for multiple hours at a time at 100 megawatts. The next is we're going to look at systems over a 30-year lifetime, and we'll assume that the loan percentage at the initial investment of the project was at 50%, where there's an 8% interest rate on that. And then last, uh, we're going to look at a base electricity price of $0.05 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's going to be the number that we use prior to any um, hourly scaling when we look at the price of buying, the impact of uh, buying low and selling high essentially uh, in our systems. Another point that I would just wanna make about the model results is that we're gonna look at a standalone energy storage system. So this is in the case where you're an owner of just the storage asset and you're buying electricity when there's a, a generation surplus and then you're discharging your battery when there's a generation deficit. Now, of course, the analysis changes when you own both storage assets as well as generating assets and a mix of them. So the model can handle that, but for the sake of simplicity today, we're gonna walk through a simple storage owner only uh, scenario. And then um, these results were put together, um, you know, here where I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we have a lot of uh, great solar resource. So our energy input is gonna be using a PV system but again, this could be adapted for any sort of generating assets that you may have in your system. Okay, so we're going to walk through different results. And the first influence we'll look at is varied electrical pricing. So we'll use that five cents per kilowatt hour as our basis and look at two scenarios. So the first scenario, which is on the top, we're going to have a flat pricing profile where no matter the hour of the day, we're going to assume we're buying and selling electricity at five cents per kilowatt hour. The second is a hypothetical 100% renewable energy scenario where there's, in this instance, a lot of uh, solar on the system where during peak daytime, the cost of electricity is lower. And then, of course, once the sun goes down, that price of electricity is scaled to a higher price when we sell it. So that's the first influence that we'll walk through. The second is power available for charging. We'll look at two cases. In one case, we'll look at when we're wanting to dispatch 100 megawatt uh, power capacity from our system, and there's 100 megawatts of excess generation that we're able to utilize for charging the system. In the other case, we'll up that, we'll double it, and we'll look at an instance where there's we're still discharging at 100 megawatts peak uh, discharge, but we actually have 200 megawatts available during the peak generation surplus. And we'll look at how that affects the system and its costing. And then last but not least is system efficiency. Now, all of the different energy storage solutions that I mentioned previously, of course, have different round trip efficiencies, which impacts the cost and performance of the system. Now, within those different technologies, thermal energy storage 
has a broad range of subset technologies that have a vast array of uh, round trip efficiencies. And so we'll use that as a, as a case to really show how uh, round trip efficiency, again, affects the system as well as what it ultimately is gonna cost the owner. In the modeling, we're gonna look at results for uh, a few of the most recognized energy storage technologies, those being lithium ion LFP, uh, which is really, you know, the more promising lithium solution for stationary storage, vanadium redox flow, pump storage hydropower, compressed air energy storage with the um, specification that that's going to be in caverns. So the cost will be much lower as opposed to if that was in a above ground uh, tank configuration, and then thermal energy storage. Now, to really kind of provide a base for the analysis, we're going to utilize the installed cost and other metrics that were reported in DOE's Energy Storage Grand Challenge cost and performance report that came out in 2022. And we're going to do this because you could, um, it's very complicated to determine what the installed cost of an energy storage system is because there's many factors, many of which are region, state uh, dependent. So Rather than getting caught up in the installed cost of the system, we're going to go with uh, what DOE feels comfortable reporting um, as these installed costs, along with other parameters like round trip efficiency, lifetime of the system, and the annual operating and maintenance costs. So hopefully that just helps set up what the basis of the analysis looks like. And this figure in the top here shows what those installed costs look like on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis four different storage durations for each of our different technologies that we're gonna assess. Okay, so first I wanna walk through here just a base uh, result to kind of orient where we're at and how these different technologies stack up against one another. Uh, but before we get into the, the analysis, I first just wanna specify how we calculate the levelized cost of the storage system over the system lifetime. So. How we do that is we sum up all the capital costs that go into the project, as well as annual O&M, the interest paid on loans, and then subtracting out any net profits that might have existed from buying and selling electricity. That is then normalized by how much energy is throughput uh, through the system, again, over the life. So here N being the 30 years of, of analysis. So to just kind of start off to look at the general trends, we're looking at a result where there was 200 megawatts of charging power available for our, our 100 peak megawatt dispatching system. And we can see some interesting trends here. So um, the first is that compressed air energy storage and pump storage hydropower are gonna deliver the lowest levelized cost of storage at many different storage durations, at, at all of the storage durations. Now. This is a, a really good result if you are, you know, if those geological features present themselves such that you can actually, uh, you know, implement these these energy storage technologies. Now, if those geological features aren't actually available, well, then it looks like thermal energy storage is uh, the next most viable candidate. Once you get up above about eight hours of storage, up to 100 hours, that system produces the lowest levelized cost of storage. Now, if we wanna go even shorter duration and still at very high power capacities, this is gonna result um, in lithium systems actually showing the best economics. So this hopefully just lays out the framework or kind of the you know, base results from this analysis. Um, and although we'll see that different parameters affect these values, um, generally the trends of what we're seeing here hold true. So something I like to mention in these talks is, uh, you know, I almost sometimes feel as though I should block out the levelized cost of storage values because um, it, it's truly very difficult to understand exactly what those uh, costs are going to be because there's so many parameters that are going to influence that. So what I think is really important here is that we're comparing systems in an even playing field. So when we look at systems within the same application space, we're able to see how they stack up against one another. And, and that's a very important result. And then we know that as we add more definition to the analysis, we can start to reveal what those, you know, 100% costs are gonna be. Okay, so first here, let's look at the influence of electricity pricing. So this first result we looked at 
is was for flat pricing. So this is buying and selling electricity at the same price. Now, if rather than doing that, we're actually buying low when there's peak generation generation from our renewable systems and selling high when uh, we need to dispatch our battery to the grid. Well, you can see right away that, of course, that's going to end up in net profits from buying and selling electricity and drive down the lifetime cost of the system. Now, all the systems benefit when you do this. And it's worth noting that in the analysis we did here for a compressed air storage system in caverns, you actually can end up with negative costing on your system, which will help uh, pay off the system in a quicker amount of time. So to that end, I, I put this result here that shows the number of years uh, that it'll take to get a return on your initial, initial capital investment. Um, and what we can see, and the reason I have the, the solid and dashed lines um, in the legend is because if you're not making a net profit buying and selling electricity, as obvious as it sounds, you're, you're not going to actually be able to pay off the system versus a scenario where you do have dynamic costing then you can start to see the periods in which you can pay off um, your energy storage system. Now, it's worth noting that levelized cost of storage, if assessed properly, is a direct ref reflection of the return on investment periods that you should anticipate for your storage system. So the lower the levelized cost, the shorter duration in which you will uh, pay off that investment. Okay, so the next thing I want to look at is the um, influence of charging power. And I apologize if uh, this is also blocking anybody else. Let me see if I can hide the video panel here. Um, here we go. Okay, good. Um, so here we're going to look at now, rather than influence of electricity pricing, we're going to look at the influence of uh, how much power is actually available to charge your battery. So moving left to right is increased storage um, duration. And then the top row is in an instance when you charge the system with 100 megawatts. And then the second system is when we charge with 200 megawatts. And what I want to point out here is that as you have increasing storage durations, you require more and more power to actually be able to charge your energy storage system. So in the top, really starting around 8 and 10 hours, you can see that for a majority of the year, you're not actually able to fully charge the battery system. So um, that's obviously problematic if you put a bunch of capital down for a very big battery, but you actually don't have the generation assets available to charge it. That's going to end up costing you, as we'll see in just a second. Then if you actually have twice as much power to charge the system, well, then, of course, you're able to charge it more times throughout the year and do that when your storage durations are ever increasing. And what you'll actually end up seeing is out here at 100 hours for a 200 megawatt charge, what you'll see is that if you want to have 100 hours of dispatch, you likely aren't ever going to really use much of that storage until the weeks or months at a time where your generation assets aren't producing um, and, and you thoroughly deplete your storage reserves. So uh, what this ends up uh, resulting in is a uh, influence on how much of the battery you're utilizing. So this is just another way of looking at the result on the top. So um, the solid lines represent 100 megawatt charging and the dash lines represent 200 megawatt charging. And so what we can see is that when you have twice as much power available to charge your energy storage system, you end up increasing the percentage of the grid demand that your system can actually satisfy. So, and, and that percentage just being the energy output from your system normalized by what the grid actually needed you to dispatch from your system. And so if you're able to charge it more uh, effectively, you'll see that you actually can bump your utilization up quite a bit. Now, this percent increase in utilization impacts all of the different technologies, but it more so impacts technologies that have a lower round trip efficiency. So take thermal energy storage, for example, which has a, you know, around a 50% nominal uh, round trip efficiency. When we double its charging power, we jump from 50% percent demand met to around 85%. So a pretty solid 35% gain there versus you contrast that with a lithium system that's already fairly efficient at around 80%. You can see that when we doubled the power available here, 
we saw a 20% increase because that that doubling of the power available essentially just took us to nearly 100% uh, demand met from our energy storage system. As you might suspect, increasing the battery utilization uh, or increasing the amount of power available is going to reduce the cost of your system. If you're paying for that capital and not using it, that's going to cost you more versus paying for capital that actually ends up getting utilized more frequently over the lifetime of the system. Now, a really interesting result reveals itself um, when we look at rather than levelized cost of storage versus storage hours as it, rather if we look at levelized cost of storage as a function of the percent demand met by the system. Again, meaning the grid wanted X amount of energy and we were only able to deliver a fraction of X from our system. So an example here is that say you're building a system and your design requirement is that, hey, we wanna put an energy storage system down that meets 70% of the grid demand. That extra 30% will buy from somebody else, but we gotta make sure that we actually can deliver from the system 70% of the time. So if there's only 100 megawatts available to charge your system, what you see is that the lowest cost solution in this instance is pump storage hydro. And if that's not an option, then the next best cost option at this demand requirement is lithium ion. Now let's say, okay, actually we have 200 megawatts available to charge this system. Well now compressed air energy storage becomes your lowest cost, cost solution followed by pump storage. And now rather than lithium ion for those without the geological features, now thermal energy storage becomes the best option. So this is one of those parameters that I think is oftentimes overlooked in levelized cost of storage analysis in that levelized cost of storage is one aspect, but how much of the grid demand your system actually satisfies is equally as important because some solutions, although they're the lowest cost, might not actually meet the demand required if you don't have the generating assets to actually charge the system. Okay, so the last point I wanna run through here um, is the influence of round trip efficiency. So again, it might be intuitive, but if you have a more efficient energy storage system, uh, the levelized cost of the system comes down. And, and this is closely related to the previous uh, impact that we just saw in that similar to having more charging power, you can think of a more efficient system as uh, in a sense, having more charging power because more of the energy that goes in is actually coming back out. And so for uh, you know the same system, if you increase your efficiency, you're gonna increase the percentage of the grid demand that your energy storage can actually deliver on. And of course, then closely related to that is, is this concept that at a levelized cost of storage requirement or at a percent demand requirement, um, you may get more bang for your buck if you're using, of course, a more efficient system. So say, for example, your criteria is this levelized cost of storage in this instance is 25 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, with a 35% thermal energy storage system here, you're not ever going to actually be able to achieve that. Okay, but then you could go with a 45% efficient system, and it can actually meet that levelized cost of storage but you're gonna cap out on a, a percent grid demand met of around 80% versus if you had a more efficient system as, as technologies improve, you could get up all the way around to 95%. So over the lifetime of the project, uh, round trip efficiency is really one of those parameters uh, along with the others that significantly impacts, you know, what you're gonna ultimately pay for your energy storage system. Okay, so I know that was a lot, but to just kind of uh, summarize the, the big takeaways here. Um, the first is that selecting an energy storage system is very scenario specific. It's, uh, you can't run one sort of analysis. It's a very complex analysis that needs to be in place. Um, so just keep that in mind. And so when you're setting up um, your models and, and looking at different solutions, I want you to keep a couple key considerations in mind. The first is what sort of power purchase agreement are you going to have in place? That, that's really, really critical to really making sure that you can pay off the system over its lifetime. The next is what is your grid demand and what is your available energy for charging? What does your portfolio of generation assets look like 
And what sort of peak charge powers can you anticipate throughout, you know, a, a normal year on your system? Then, of course, system efficiency is going to play a really key role. And I would say it largely ties into how much energy is available for charging. If you're really tight on energy available for charging, then more efficient systems are going to give you a little bit better return. Whereas if you have a lot of excess energy and say you're in an, in an instance where you're curtailing a lot of energy, well, then a less efficient system and it, in addition, having a low cost nature will be a better energy storage solution for you. Um, then, of course, you know, consider a percent demand requirement. Um, it's, you know, of course, as I'm sure you know, it's very important to, to make sure that the, the storage asset you're putting down is going to actually deliver uh, and meet the objective that you have in mind for your decarbonization goals. And, of course, just make sure that the LCOS or return on investment requirement are favorable for um, the, the financial obligations that you've entered into. Um, so with that, uh, I really look forward to your questions. And again, I appreciate you all having me here today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Luke. With that, we'll now open the floor for questions. Okay, and once again, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A box so we can uh, get to them. Thank you. And I apologize if I miss them in advance. I've got about 20 different screens that I'm trying to monitor for questions and hands raised and all that good stuff. Okay, we've got one question here in the Q&A. Um, this was focused on solar. Does the situation change if the pattern of intermittency is different, like for wind? Yeah, uh, yeah, great question, right? So, um, of course, so the, the lifetime cost of the system, as I touched on, is going to be very dependent on, you know, what does your grid demand look like and what's the portfolio of generating assets that you have? Uh, so I, I think the exact numbers are gonna, you know, end up getting influenced by what your predominant generating asset is. However, I can tell you that the, the factors that we went through that really seem to have a large impact on, on costing the systems don't change. So although you might have a very different looking portfolio of generation assets, the, the key factors of, you know, power purchase agreement, making sure you have sufficient energy to actually charge your system and very closely related what the efficiency of the system actually is, those factors don't really go away. But I think the general trend that, um, you know, uh, the, the trend that we saw that the lower installed cost systems ultimately end up having lower levelized costs is gonna hold mostly true, um, ex except for in instances where you're really you know, undercharging your system and then, then the economics kind of seem to switch. Thanks, Luke. Um, another question about solar. Uh, does the length of Alaska's daylight compl uh, complicate those calculations? Um, yeah, yeah, 100%, right? So um, it, again, tying into this theme of making sure you can actually charge your system you know, if, if there's daylight complexity, um, you know, uh, I, I don't live in Alaska, so I don't understand all the nuances, but, you know, if the solar is not as good, let's say on average, well, then you're either going to end up paying for more PV to oversize to make sure you can charge your system, or you're going to need to look at a system that's more efficient that, um, you know, doesn't necessarily require as much excess energy. So, 
Um, again, if, if you're going to try to make a decision, um, you know, it, it's important to use the modeling tools and apply them specifically to your application versus just taking something that's out there that wasn't done for your system. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. Um, I'm trying to sort through the questions while I'm keeping an eye on them. Um, we've got a question here. Uh, the cost of power figures were stated at around five cents per kilowatt hour. And how do the storage options change when you're looking at closer to 27 cents per kilowatt hour? Yeah, so um, it, it really depends, again, on how you're um, costing throughout the day. So actually, in the instance where um, we did the flat pricing, you're buying and selling at the same price, which probably is, you know, of course, isn't done in a real power purchase agreement, th that's going to have no effect because um, it, it'll affect the overall cost of the system. But in terms of the relative, uh, you know, who, who had the lower relative cost versus the higher relative cost, that's not going to change. Where that could come into play is when you're doing the dynamic costing. Um, so if you're, uh, you know, I don't know if that in that question, if you're buying or selling at 27% kilowatt hour, if you're selling closer to that value, of course, you'll improve your rate of return. Um, and if you're buying at that, well, then um, that doesn't necessarily bode well uh, for being able to pay off that investment. But um, although I think changing that cost is going to change where those values all sat on the y-axis, they're going to move all within the same relative distance to one another. Thanks again. Um, and I noticed there's a video lag on my end. That might just be me. So it oh, no looks worries. a little bit of funny. I can hear you in real time and I can hear myself in real time, but the video is definitely lagging on my end. Um, so another question, let's see, um, about standby losses for thermal storage. How do yeah. the standby losses for thermal storage affect the performance for wind uh, when uh, bounced around? where there's not a regular pattern of energy uh, like solar? Yeah, really good uh, question. So um, the, the first answer to that question is that, uh, so energy storage losses as a function of, of holding time are built into this model. So of course a thermal system is, you know, looking at around one to 2% uh, energy loss per hour versus a, a, say an electrochemical battery, which is, you know, less than a percentage per hour. Um, so, so that's built in. And then uh, more from an operation standpoint, um, uh, a thermal system, you're going to have to make sure it's, it's uh, able to ramp up and ramp down very quickly. So one of the risks with thermal systems is, is shocking the system. If it's been sitting and all of a sudden you need to ramp up, um, you need to make sure that the, all the equipment you're going to pass that heat through um, is rated to take that rapid increase in temperature. So, um, you know, I, I would say that really is going to tie into within the thermal realm, which of the specific subset technologies has that dynamic capability um, to make sure that it, it's more suitable for that dynamic response. Great. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, we're going to close out the questions with that, and then we will move on to the next presenter. Uh, All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Luke. And so once again, Thanks to Luke. Uh, next up, we have Michelle Wilbur, who will be talking about beneficial electrification. Uh, Michelle is a research engineer here at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. So with that, take it away, Michelle. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, apologies for the dramatic lighting. It is a very rainy, cloudy day in Anchorage, where I work today um, on the traditional lands of the Denina. Uh, let me press share screen. And I assume somebody will yell at me if my sound or my picture is bad. All right. Um, so I am a research engineer who is leading up an initiative at ASAP on uh, research and beneficial and equitable electrification. We've added the word, you probably heard of beneficial electrification that refers to technologies like electric vehicles and heat pumps that move traditionally fossil fuel burning direct appliances like uh, boilers and furnaces and uh, transportation over to electric options that are uh, generally ba based on their technology quite efficient and have a lot of potential 
benefits both economic uh, for the utilities as well as the users um, and, and environmental with reducing emissions. But there are some questions about making sure that these technologies are equitable and are spreading their benefits widely to all. And in many places in the globe, uh, this is happening based on the reduced emissions and lower um, utility costs as, as volume of electric sales goes up uh, being broadly shared among everyone. But we have some questions about this in Alaska because uh, I would hazard to say based on my research that if you plunked an electric vehicle down or you had some, somebody um, transition to an electric vehicle from a gas burning vehicle in Juneau, their um, individual benefits would be huge as far as reduced emissions uh, in their garage near their home and in reduced costs. And, and in general, in Anchorage, there would also be positive benefits. But if you did this in some of the colder regions of the state or some of the less clean electricity generation generating regions of the state or more expensive electricity generating regions of the state, uh, the average person transferring over to an electric vehicle may see higher costs and higher uh, be responsible for higher emissions. So that equitable is, is a huge thing and it really motivates a lot of our research into these technologies and how they perform economically as well as engineering wise and in other ways in Alaska. So um, we have a, a large group of researchers, some of which I'll call out by name, that are investigating either um, broad uh, implications of these transitions on electric grids or policy and, and economics, um, and also researchers looking at individual technologies with a focus on electric vehicles and electric heating. And um, I myself am focusing my research generally on electric vehicles with a couple of funded projects, um, one of which is looking specifically at electric vehicles in rural Alaska. Uh, I won't probably have time to get into all of the nitty gritty details, but I'll do a broad overview and happy to answer any questions um, and kind of hit on a number of points of importance. So um, one of the tools we've developed is a uh, Alaska specific electric vehicle calculator. We've worked with um, people in rural Alaska and other stakeholders to try to make this calculator really easy to use. It's web-based. The um, short URL is at the top of the screen. Feel free to use it and share it widely. It's um, always as we get new data on electric vehicle performance and cold weather and different vehicles that are hitting the market like the new trucks. Uh, we update our calculator um, with that latest uh, database in the model, but we uh, use online community um, resources of electric rates and emiss emissivity of the power plants and um, climate details, hourly weather, typical weather data to calculate what or to compare, calculate emissions and costs for fueling an electric vehicle um, versus a gas vehicle. And, and there are some choices you can make if you want to that are pretty nitpicky on, on the details of, of how much you drive and on what days and things like that. Um, but on the broad level, it's a really easy to use calculator and gives a broad result. And one of the things that comes out uh, of the base model for this is that in most regions of Alaska, we have a uh, cold climate, as you're aware. And so there is a lot of energy used for driving um, for the typical driver. And there is more energy used for driving in the winter because you're heating the cabin and other things that are requiring more electric use. But also the battery to perform optimally needs to be kept warm. And this leads both to some increased energy use in the winter for driving the same number of miles, but it also leads to parked energy use. So much like a gas vehicle, might be plugged in in a cold climate to a block heater plug to keep the uh, keep the vehicle ready to go and operating efficiently. Uh, an electric vehicle is basically using some energy either from a plug if it's plugged in or from its own battery to keep the battery happy at all times. And and how much it uses depends on the the um, thermal management system of the vehicle. So it is model dependent as well as dependent on some factors of temperature and whether or not it's plugged in and things like that. So so the model attempts to sort of generalize that and and come up with a picture. But that means that the energy use of an electric vehicle is highly seasonal. So as that load becomes an electric load on the grid, that adds seasonality 
um, as well as some some high peaks, depending on how many vehicles are plugged in at what what uh, level of demand of charging uh, to that grid. So that's something that definitely needs more research. Um, like I said, there are some definite, you know, I, I hit on a couple of the challenges of electric vehicles in this state with cold weather, um, but there are a lot of opportunities as well. I actually see huge opportunities for increased beneficial electrification of people adopting these technologies um, into their homes and businesses and, and transportation choices for helping with the modern grid, with the transition that we are doing to cleaner sources of generation. Um, variable renewables like wind and solar need storage and a more uh, peaky grid where our loads are, are have higher seasonality and, and higher uh, day to hour to hour peaks um, need storage. Electric vehicles are storage. They are some pretty huge batteries on wheels. Um, for them to be equitable and beneficial to Alaskans, they need cleaner power. So you can't clean up a gas vehicle once you've bought it really. Uh, you know, it's least challenging. The fuel you put in and is what it's going to burn. Um, but if you buy an electric vehicle and the grid you're charging it from gets cleaner, more renewables are added to it or other clean energy sources, then that vehicle is getting cleaner because those emissions are from the power plant. Um, and maybe they need incentives. Maybe they need special uh, rates at, at off-peak times for charging or other things to make them more cost-effective to the person driving that vehicle or paying to charge that vehicle. And so maybe there, maybe there is a win-win a sort of situation here where there are solutions that, that can benefit both those that are switching over to these technologies, perhaps for um, reasons of, of wanting to uh, participate in the energy transition and a cleaner climate, or maybe for other reasons, but uh, ways to help the, the electric grid out at the same time and lower costs all around. Um, so I'm going to kind of uh, go through slides first, sort of electric vehicle specific and then heat pump specific, because there are kind of those two broad divisions, although there's a lot of overlap in, in some of the overarching um, takeaways from, from this research. Uh, this is from a Bloomberg report on prediction. So, you know, we do a lot of thinking about what are, what are people just going to do naturally excuse me with the with the incentives and the and the way that the industry is going and in, in manufacturing and and other sorts of outside of Alaska the picture of electric vehicles and heat pumps and because these are not necessarily big um, purchase decisions by a utility or by the state, but there are a bunch of individual purchase decisions by business owners and, and individuals. And so there's a lot of things that go into it. I would posit that maybe most people don't first choose a car based on um, the overall net present value of that car. There's, there's a lot of considerations going into it. And certainly price is one of them. Purchase price is one of them and fueling price. Um, but there's a lot of other things going into it. And probably the the uh, popularity of some electric vehicle models is is based more on how cool they are, maybe than their overall economic picture. So, so there's going to be a lot of things that determine whether these are taken up in our market, um, and we're trying to get a handle on on what that might look like. Um, sort of maybe absent other incentives or special rates, or or with the with the ones that seem to be happening across the globe. So so this is a global picture, and you've had some time to to look at it while I've jabbered on um, on. I, I'm most interested on the right hand side, passenger EVs as a share of the fleet where the y-axis goes from zero to 100% of EVs in the fleet. So 100% of course is that all the vehicles on the road or in the fleet are electric. And the timeline goes up to 2040 and there's kind of a global average leading markets. I think the US is kind of heading there with some of the IRA and other incentives and then emerging markets, which they in, uh, describe as places like South America and Africa and some other locations like that. Um, I would posit that perhaps rural Alaska with very cold temperatures and diesel generation and um, things like that might be closer to an emerging market trend, perhaps. Um, the rail belt, especially in places like Anchorage and 
Kenai Peninsula and the, the valley, um, we might be closer to global. Who knows? I um, do not have any crystal balls. Um, but like I said, in trying to figure out how, what to model, how to model, how to model grid impacts, we're trying to get some idea of how many of, of these vehicles and, and how many of these individual pieces of technology might be in there to, to look at what that would look like. So there's been a, a recent paper um, just published by my collaborator, Felicia Cecilio and others. And it looks at load electrification adoption and behind the meter solar forecasting as well for Alaska's rail belt transmission system. Um, so there's a DOI that will be with the presentation if anybody wants to read that paper in its entirety. But it does a, look, a lot of looking at um, trends that have been put forward by people within the state as well as outside of the state and getting some idea of what things might look like along the way, but also in an endpoint of 2050, because there's a modeling effort going going um, around that. And this is very challenging because we expect battery technologies and all kinds of things might change um, technology-wise by 2050, um, but just trying to get somewhere to start. So um, for this uh, plot here, there's a percent of EVs in the rail belt electric or the rail belt vehicle fleet um, a timeline again, and then there's uh, taking the Michael Baker report for the NEBI, the charging plan for the state done by AEA or done by Michael Baker for AEA, taking that um, both aggressive and moderate uh, forecast of electric vehicles based on our, our recent uptake and other factors, and then um, taking those trends forward, you know, with a fit of the curves. And, and looking at those versus some of the national trends, um, the this paper picked out a moderate level forecast for 2050 as well as an aggressive. The aggressive is just 90% um, transition to electric vehicles. That's not based on a realistic thought that that's where we'll be, except for there are some national trends predicting us being there by then. Um, instead, it's meant to create sort of an endpoint or a, a high level for modeling just to see what some of those bounds might be. But even the, um, the moderate forecast, which actually follows the AEA aggressive rate, but is fairly in line with um, some of those national trends assumed and global trends, even not in the, the leading areas, um, puts us up to 70% adoption by 2050 and, you know, 20% adoption or so by 2040, which those years are coming quickly. Um, and then looking at what that does to load. So this is not base load plus EV. This is just the EV load forecast for um, three regions of the grid. So uh, the central is um, highest there because there's a lot of population in the Anchorage and Matsu region. Um, Southern is uh, is lower because the energy use is less for vehicles in that area. And then the Northern region where we have some extreme cold in the winter has a, sort of a higher energy use profile or, or power profile for electric vehicle adoption in that moderate profile by 2050. And so this is for the whole year. And this is for a representative day in the winter and a representative day in the summer. Um, this is using charging profiles. So, you know, the vehicle uses power when it uses power, but it takes power from the grid and becomes a load when people are charging it. And so this is using ISO New England um, data on actual charging loads. So not based on some crazy, the utility is going to control when you can charge or have some very aggressive rate structure that, that helps, you know, um, shape that load. It's, it's based on data of what that load is like in a, in a colder region. Um, comparing this is to a baseline load forecast. So without the electrification um, vehicles and, and heat pumps added in, uh, it, it's just a small percentage higher than the, the current load profile. So we're looking at this central anchored region somewhere, you know, peaks around a little above 500 megawatts. And those electric vehicle peaks in the winter are also about that. High. So, so just as an idea of scale there. Um, Kind of stepping off of those predictions, there was another recent paper, not by anybody at ASAP, but an interesting paper this year, 
in nature on how EVs themselves could satisfy global short-term grid storage needs uh, by 2030 and, and into the future. So just electric vehicles, generally just the vehicles on the road with, um, with grid to car and car to grid charging, so bi-directional charging could, could satisfy storage demands without any additional stationary storage based on their modeling of, of multiple different scenarios. Um, and in some of the tougher scenarios, they did need to use second use batteries. So batteries taken out of vehicles at the end of their effective life in the vehicle, but used then a storage, uh, stationary storage that, that, that satisfied the need. So I, I think that's pretty intriguing as something to think about. Um, and then closer to home, years before that came out, uh, our own Clay Copeland, um, analyzed it and figured out that for, for the cost of the Cordova electric battery energy storage system, the stationary storage, he could have bought uh, 52 Nissan Leafs for the for the community, and people could have basically gotten subsidized transportation for the same benefits that the um, stationary storage provided. And of course, when you are trying to incentivize people's behavior, even you know the vehicle is parked most of the time, not driving, so potentially available for a grid balancing. Um, but you know the devil's in the details of of how you incentivize allowing that vehicle to be used. I mean, if you give somebody a free car and free charging, I guess maybe they'll let you dispatch it however you want when they're not driving. But um, who knows? There's some questions to be worked out there. Luckily, lots of people are trying to work these things out before we even get to it. So uh, utilities in um, California and in Vermont and other places are looking at uh, bi-directional charging on vehicles, vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle, and, and how to make those programs work so that they get the benefits. Um, the utility gets the benefits, the customer gets the benefits, and, and the, the um, vehicles are used for that purpose. Um, this is a plot of my own. I have a fourplex with six kilowatts of solar on the roof in, in salt capacity and an electric vehicle level two charging station. And just over two days in April, you could see that even with just managed charging, not necessarily bi-directional, the load of the building is, is generally pretty low. Um, blue is electricity coming in. And in this case, this big peak here is five hours of charging in the middle of the night of the vehicle. And um, the green is when there's electricity being exported from the grid from the solar. So just um, in this case, Trigatch Electric uh, tells me that charging at night is still the best thing for their grid, even with the solar going in. But if at some point it made more sense to spread out the electric vehicle charging and soak up that excess solar, then just by moving around when charging happens with other um, needs for the grid or the, the local area, um, there's a lot you could do with just managing that charging. And that's actually what Green Mountain Power is working on right now. They have charging rates where they will help you manage your charging during peaks. And we're not very peaky right now on the rail belt maybe, but um, as you'll see from some of these plots, we may, may be heading towards peakiness as, as beneficial electrification um, increases. And it's not a new concept. People in 2012 were already thinking about back when electric vehicles looked like they might be a thing. Um, at the time, uh, people were already looking at charging electric vehicles off peak to help improve the load factor on the grid in Chicago. Okay, so transitioning over to heat pumps, um, another uh, ASAP um, great research collaborator, uh, Aaron Trosham worked with a bunch of students from the University of Washington. They have a data science cohort of grad students that does projects, um, data science projects with researchers who have questions. We've worked with them for electric vehicle maps and, and other questions around and solar questions with our group. Um, but they worked on creating a visualization tool to look at heat pump adoption in Alaska. Um, one of the main models behind this was the heat pump calculator that Alan Mitchell with Analysis North helped put together with a, a group of Alaskan um, stakeholders and that's available online. Uh, the, the address for this visualization, which is brand new, just had hit the streets is, is on this slide. Um, and so there's a lot of, you can look up their methodology. There's a lot of tabs to explain that but the meat of it are a number of visualizations. They've got kind of a pixelized grid ver version of 
the regions of the state. So in this case, if, if you, I was on the live version, when I hovered over it, it would give me details, but this is the municipality of Anchorage. Um, yes, this is a little geographically wonky, but it makes sense in its way. This is Matsu, um, Golden Valley territory up here, uh, Kenai Peninsula, et cetera, Southeast, Aleutians, um, et cetera. And when you look at uh, just adding heat pumps into the system, they have an underlying equation for how those would be adopted based on the amount of, of uh, days that the heat pump would meet the heating loads in the area based on technological constraints of heat pump technology on the market right now, as, as well as um, some other uh, factors involved. And so it, it kind of does some prediction of where those 15% of heat pumps might go if you were to increase to that, that penetration of heat pumps. Um, you can look at some other things, trends there. So, so it's definitely an interesting visualization to allow you to look at, and there's some other tabs that allow you to look at the economic and economical and, and um, uh, environmental impacts of heat pump adoption in the regions. Um, and then the, the Cecilio Felicia's paper also looks at heat pump adoption, much like it did with the electric vehicles. It looks at, it takes Chugach Electric's um, uh, prediction um, curves, uh, upgrades those to be rail belt wide, and then takes the their aggressive um, curve at 2050 as the moderate forecast with that's pretty much 15% again, but this in this case, residential and commercial buildings have one heat pump installed with backup heating. Um, the aggressive again is 90% adoption just to look at what happens with loads if most um, buildings have taken up that technology. So it's not meant to be a realistic scenario by 2050, but just a, a what if, what does this do? Um, so with back to that moderate 15%, of buildings have a heat pump in them. Um, it's a much more po moderate uh, power um, curve through the year. Uh, it's again, highly seasonal of course, because we don't have much cooling load. We have a lot of heating load in the state, at least as, as where we are now. And, um, and so that's definitely not at the level of the moderate forecast for EV load. Uh, but if you start looking at even more, um, that more of the aggressive heat pump adoption, then that's definitely changing that picture. So then this from the same paper is uh, the 2021, so just two years ago, um, rail belt total load, so power in megawatts on this, on the y-axis, days of the year or hours, I think this is an hourly load, so hours of the year on the x-axis, and looking at what we have now basically versus what we might have without um, really managing the, those uh, electrified loads. And this is the moderate situation. So about 15% of buildings have a heat pump and the, there are 70% of vehicles have become our electric vehicles by 2050. And um, you know that, that may be what happens and it may not be what happens. But in that case, the load becomes much, much peakier, much, um, much more variable hour to hour and also um, much more variable throughout the year. So those are definitely two things to think of. Um, and again, without some aggressive management of, of that load. Uh, in the high adoption scenario where everybody has turned to these technologies in huge numbers and, and there's just a, a small amount of vehicles and buildings that are, are not served by electrification, um, in that case, we have uh, oh, and of course, the total energy use and the peak load is much, much higher in both of these scenarios, but certainly um, more in this scenario. And in this case, because they also looked at behind the meter solar, and I did not show you those prediction curves, but they also look at, at recent trends and keeping those and trends in other regions and then um, pulling those, those trends forward. Um, you actually see minimal or um, the minimum loads in the summer going down as that behind the meter solar is pulling the, the load down. So again, very variable, both um, hour to hour and seasonally. And so this is uh, a challenge, but I also think it's an opportunity because the vehicle itself 
it has you know a large battery in it so it is it is storage um thermal loads also have inherent storage based on the thermal um, characteristics of the building but thermal storage can be added either in water tanks phase change materials what have you and so one of the things at asap that we would like to do moving forward is to start to really investigate um, not just the technological feasibility of some of these off-the-shelf technologies or newly emerging technologies in our really cold regions in Alaska, um, but also what is some of the, the possibilities for controls, for storage, um, for integrating these things together, perhaps also with behind the meter solar. So we're hoping to fund a test building in the Fairbanks area, which as everybody know, has very cold winters so that we can um, look at some of these things and some of the implications for incentives uh, in rate structure and other things at helping this transition be um, pleasant and not painful and beneficial to everyone. And so uh, with that, I, I know I kind of went in a lot of different directions, but I'm happy to take any questions people have and take a stab at, at answering or enlightening or um, expanding on any of these topics. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and as a reminder, please place your questions in the Q&A box down on the lower part of the screen, and I'll be prioritizing questions from the task force members. So we did have one question. I, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but we had a question about the um, number of electric vehicles presently between a certain geographic area, um, between Cantwell and, uh, well, basically in GBA service area. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, AEA is getting the DMV data and uh, we, we did, hope to do a data share, but it sounds like it would be um, uh, kind of convoluted to do that. So we are hoping to get updated results um, from the Alaska Energy Authority as they do their analysis on that data. Um, if that's something that they don't have the capacity for, we have been interested in getting a hold of and doing our own analysis. Um, we have not done one for a few years, so our numbers are not up to date and adoption has been um, ramping up steeply. So I would hesitate to draw any conclusions from our analysis a couple of years ago of DMV data. Thanks, Michelle. Yep, that's a very specific question, which... I know there's a number, but I don't know what that number is. We have data from 10 Teslas in the Fairbanks, uh, Cantwell to Fairbanks area, um, and there are more. Those are just people who were willing to share data with us and other types, types of vehicles, of course. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I see a hand up in the participant list. If you can type your question into the Q&A, that would be very helpful. Okay, looks like there aren't any questions forthcoming. So we will move on to the next presentation. Next, thank you, Michelle. Next up, um, we've got Ben Leffler with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. Ben will be presenting on a mixed metaphor, making waves tidal power in Alaska. Okay, thank you, Ben. The floor is yours. All right, thanks. Everything coming through okay? Uh, I can hear you okay. My internet is slow, so I am not a good judge. <laughs> okay. Yes, we're seeing you with slide. No, looks like I mixed up my screens here. Uh, there we go. Slides look good. Yes. All right. Uh, well, hello. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to 
share out some of this information with this group in particular. Um, be trying to cover a kind of a wide range of things that I think are relevant uh, for the task force. I'll start with an overview of marine energy, focus on Cook Inlet, uh, talk a little bit about tidal technology, and then get into some of the work that's, that we've been doing uh, with NREL and PNNL and the Tidal Energy Working Group, uh, and then uh, some comments on uh, ongoing activities and opportunities. Um, so everything in this presentation, a lot of the content is actually from Levi Kilcher at NREL and Zhao Ching Yang at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, Levi has done field work in Cook Inlet. He's from Homer. Uh, and Zhao Ching uh, has done a lot of the modeling uh, of the Cook Inlet Basin. Uh, and then my work here at ASAP uh, under UAF uh, is uh, all part of the Pacific Marine Energy Center. So we collaborate with Oregon State and University of Washington on uh, most of our marine energy work. Uh, so yeah, any anything with this NREL tag on it is likely one of Levi's um, slides and likely uh, work coming out of his group at NREL. Uh, but just as an overview of marine energy in general, and so this slide is looking just at wave, tidal, ocean current, uh, and then for warmer places, uh, ocean thermal. Uh, but essentially almost half of the U.S.'s marine energy is in Alaska's waters. Um, largely wave, uh, but uh, Alaska has more than half of the nation's tidal resource, and a large fraction of that is in Cook Inlet. I think Cook Inlet alone is uh, somewhere around a third of the nation's total tidal energy resource. Uh, and then looking specifically at uh, Cook Inlet, uh, in this slide, they're including offshore wind, uh, which is really just an immense uh, potential resource. Uh, but if you look in at, at Cook Inlet here, uh, you can see that a large fraction of Cook Inlet's marine energy resource, including wind, is that tidal resource, and that there are uh, tidal resources uh, out in the Aleutians uh, and down in southeast Alaska as well. So now focusing in on Cook Inlet specifically, uh, Levi and Zhao Ching's, Levi's field work and Zhao Ching's modeling indicate that the total theoretical resource uh, in Cook Inlet is about 18 gigawatts uh, on average, which is about 30 times the current rail belt load. Um, and there is existing infrastructure there, uh, both in the water with the oil and gas platforms and shoreside with uh, um, uh, shipping terminals and potential, you know, natural gas infrastructure development. Uh, and some estimates expect the sort of blue economy of, of marine energy and marine uh, economic activity uh, reaching 3 trillion by 2030. And so the question Levi poses is what will Alaska's role be here? Um, but looking at, at Cook Inlet in particular and, and sort of the advantages that tidal energy may deliver is that it's uh, predictable. Uh, you know, the cycles, the tidal cycles can be predicted, you know, hundreds or thousands of years out. Um, and one possibility that Levi uh, calls out here is that uh, the tidal resource sort of varies along the inlet. And so in this case, he's uh, modeling uh, tidal array deployments in three locations in the lower, middle, and upper Cook Inlet, and then sort of overlaying the uh, the power production from those. Uh, and so you can never get away from sort of the cyclical nature, uh, but you can sort of uh, leverage offsets to, uh, to smooth that out a little bit. But the big advantage over wind or compared to wind and solar from tidal is that your storage requirements are much like the statistical variance on your uh, storage requirements is much smaller. Uh, and so that that will play a factor if tidal technology gets to the point where it's it's being implemented at scale. Uh, so a little bit on tidal technology, just a quick uh, differentiator. So wind turbines and, and solar panels have really um, uh, coalesced around like specific approaches that are the most economical that, you know, wind turbines have a single mast with three blades. Um, there's still, I guess, some gearbox or non-gearbox differentiators, uh, but we haven't seen that in the hydrokinetic space. So hydrokinetics just referring to tidal or riverine applications where you're putting a turbine directly into the existing flow of water, uh, not doing any dams or diverters or barrages. Uh, and so on the left uh, is an axial flow turbine that looks more like uh, a wind turbine. And on the right here is a, a cross flow configuration. 
And cross flow can have the, it's more like an egg beater. The axis can be vertical or, or horizontal, but in both cases, it's uh, transverse to the flow. Uh, and so here's a slide Levi put together with sort of an assortment of hydrokinetic turbine technologies or, or tidal turbine technologies that are uh, being developed and tested and advanced at the moment. Uh, and the top left is the cross flow turbine from ORPC at Igiagig. Uh, in the center, here's a bottom mount. Uh, axial flow machine from Europe. On the right is a bottom mount axial flow machine that went in the East River uh, in uh, New York, uh, company Verdant Power. Uh, this one on the left in the middle row is a unique, it's an axial flow machine, but it's actually on a uh, what they call a kite. Uh, and so uh, a fundamental challenge with tidal technology is that you end up with a low speed rotation that's really high torque, uh, but your electrical generators want a higher speed, lower torque configuration. And so uh, a lot of these systems either implement very high pole count custom generators that are expensive, or they implement gearboxes, uh, which add cost and uh, reduce efficiency. So uh, this, this kite approach from the company Monesto actually uses control surfaces on these wings to fly a figure eight pattern under the water and accelerate the flow over the turbine through that flight path and uh, eliminate the need for a gearbox. Um, the center one axial flow from a company Takardo, but this is a surface mount. So it, it lowers into the water from the surface as opposed to being sunk to the bottom, uh, like the three on the top row. And so you can just see there's a whole bunch of different uh, topologies, surface mount, bottom mount, uh, floating or rigid structure. Uh, this bottom right one has a piling that the turbines move up and down. Uh, and so we just haven't seen that convergence around a single design architecture in the turbine space yet. Uh, just some examples of work that's going on at the national labs and at, at other universities, uh, everything from blade testing, uh, testing new materials and construction methods, uh, blade fabrication testing in the middle, uh, PTOs, this is a gearbox that's being tested in a laboratory setting. Uh, this colorful picture is array modeling, uh, investigating how the wake of turbines affects downstream uh, turbine performance and what the optimal spacing and staggering is. Uh, and it looks like more uh, embedding sensors in, in blade materials on the right here. Uh, this is an overview of, of Levi and NREL's uh, field work at the East Foreland. So on the top left, uh, this is colored by depth. Uh, so the main channel and actually where most of the energy potential is, is this main channel closer to the west side of the forelands. Uh, but the highest velocities in the channel are actually at the east forelands here, so-called hotspot, closer to shore, potentially easier interconnection. Uh, so Levi and his team are out there, I think, two or three years ago now, uh, deploying current measurement uh, devices on the bottom and in the midwater and really characterizing uh, the resource there, both in terms of just raw velocity and uh, in terms of turbulence and uh, turbidity, sediment, uh, salinity, all of those uh, factors. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the idea there is to really lay the groundwork for sort of developing a pilot project in Cook Inlet. Uh, so now kind of moving into context, and I think this group is uh, probably well aware of the situation. Uh, and so this will be uh, just uh, a review, but uh, looking at Cook Inlet with regards to Alaska's rail belt, you know, 600 megawatt average load, 40% of that coming from natural gas. And so when I'm talking about tidal energy broadly, um, look at the motivations and then look at the challenges. Uh, so motivations here are, you know, you have an existing energy source in the inlet that's in decline. You have this large and predictable tidal resource. You have technologies that are being developed at this megawatt scale. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that uh, FERC, preliminary FERC permits, I think three now have been issued or even four, I think there have been four now issued in Cook Inlet uh, in various parts of the inlet. So developers are starting to be you know, interested in pursuing projects. Um, and I believe this is a quote from the, from the governor uh, with regards to the RPS efforts uh, about it being time for Alaskans to think about where we wanna be 20 years from now. And so I think that's a good perspective to take with title that um, there are other technologies that are uh, more deserving of attention in the near term, but 
uh, there is this large predictable resource out there that that may be advantageous to the state in the long term. Uh, and it may play a role in synthetic fuel uh, production as well, which I'll touch on a little more. And uh, and so I, I always couch tidal energy in the context of what the alternatives are. And so, you know, how do we deal with declining hook inlet gas? And as Michelle talked about, you know, increasing electrification in the coming years. Uh, and so there's a lot of options on the table, whether it's a gas pipeline, LNG import, build out of additional hydro, uh, advanced nuclear, um, and I'm sure there's a few others, uh, you know, obviously just scale up of wind and solar and, and storage. Um, and so when it comes to tidal, you know, ultimately there's going to be the economic question of whether uh, highly reliable turbines that can function in the Cook Inlet environment can be built economically. Uh, how those factors of grid integration and storage uh, factor in. And then uh, one thing I haven't touched on, but I will in more detail is what, what is the environmental impact of uh, tidal turbines in Cook Inlet? Uh, so uh, folks on this call are probably aware of the uh, RPS report that I believe the governor's office commissioned from NREL uh, last year uh, and they sort of looked at, you know, poss possible different scenarios towards uh, an 80% RPS of, you know, different integrations of tidal wind, uh, PV, et cetera. Uh, and so at least in these scenarios, you can see the tidal plays kind of a smaller role in scenarios four and five, uh, and wind uh, really took the lead. Wind and hydro were the two big contributors uh, across the scenarios. Um, I think this was a very high level analysis, and I just want to note that uh, Dr. Cicilino Felicia is working uh, with OSU on a grid integration modeling effort, uh, specifically looking at Cook Inlet tidal integration on the rail belt. Uh, and so kind of to put a, to wrap up just sort of the high level uh, tidal energy uh, thoughts that, you know, there's sort of a progression that's envisioned where you do uh, Fundamental, you know, just R&D pilot projects, potentially uh, looking to power an existing oil and gas platform, then looking at grid connection, contributing to that RPS goal. Uh, but, but the resource is large enough that if, you know, if, if all the other challenges are, are mitigated, uh, there's the potential to produce synthetic fuels for export, whether that's um, hydrogen or ammonia or methanol, whether that's exporting on the global market or uh, to remote parts of Alaska to replace, you know, other liquid uh, fuel needs, uh, heating and transportation. Uh, and then there's also potential this integrates with uh, carbon sequestration efforts that are being uh, evaluated for, for Cook Inlet. So now I'll, uh, I'll report out some preliminary information from the uh, the Cook Inlet Tidal Working Group, which has been tasked with developing a tidal energy roadmap uh, for Cook Inlet, we had a total of six working group meetings uh, with anywhere from 20 to 45 participants. Uh, the participants in the working group were everything from uh, title technology developers, project developers, uh, representatives of Alaska utilities, uh, uh, Cook Inlet user groups, uh, state and federal regulatory agency representatives attended, uh, and then of course folks from the university and the national labs. Um, and so these working group meetings focused on uh, data needs and gaps, permitting and regulatory. Uh, we had an overview of global uh, tidal energy projects elsewhere on the globe. Uh, we heard about tidal array modeling efforts and sort of uh, getting a realistic picture of what scaling up tidal in the inlet would look like, how it might affect uh, flow, uh, water flow, tidal water flow through the inlet. Uh, and then we had a presentation on sort of a, the current assessment of project costs and economics. Um, and all of this is being coalesced into a, a public report uh, on the roadmap. Uh, the drafting is underway and we're hoping to get that out the door this fall. So uh, now I'm just sort of pulling slides uh, that came out of the working group to kind of give a high level uh, overview of, of some of the outcomes. Uh, so the working group identified data needs and gaps in a variety of um, areas. Uh, there's still work to be done on resource assessment. There's uh, work to be done on the specific sites of interest, these FERC, preliminary FERC sites in particular. 
Uh, a lot of work to be done on the environmental side that we're trying to get ahead of uh, establishing baselines, uh, looking for data that were collected for other projects, whether it was bridges or oil and gas or uh, just fundamental sort of conservation science and uh, determining what uh, relevancy that has to title projects, scoping and development. Um, and then, you know, being at the R&D stage, it's hard to get economic data out of uh, developers, but I think that'll come more into focus as more more pilot projects get underway. Uh, one really valuable outcome of the working group was uh, a uh, organization and uh, sort of, uh, what's the right word? But basically, we got all of the uh, regulatory agencies and the, the level, the types of engagement that would need to happen uh, all laid out and uh, consolidated into, into one place. Uh, and so this is just an overview of the anticipated uh, regulatory and permitting uh, things that, that would apply to a pilot project in Cook Inlet. And so, uh, you know, this being made public, I think will help uh, everyone who's looking at the space evaluate what that path forward looks like. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of, uh, of agencies to engage with and, uh, and regulatory uh, things to comply with. Uh, other considerations, obviously, uh, existing uses of the inlet, uh, and so some maps of, you know, fishing activity and ship traffic, uh, and, you know, engaging with, uh, local users of the waterways to ensure that, uh, any tidal energy development is compatible with existing uses. So on, uh, the environmental side, uh, marine mammals, the, the Cook Inlet Beluga are sort of the, uh, poster child uh, of this, but there are 13 species in the inlet covered by the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, and there are five Endangered Species Act species in Cook Inlet. Um, and so while the beluga are important, there's a lot more that's important uh, otherwise as well. Uh, the upside is that, you know, there's a lot of operational experience complying with these uh, protection acts uh, from existing oil and gas and shipping and fishing activities. Um, and so this will be, you know, sort of a fundamental early hurdle for any, any tidal energy development. Okay. And so coming out of the, the working group will be a roadmap for uh, development uh, depicted in the top. There is sort of a, a pathway towards perhaps like a hundred megawatt uh, target of nameplate target by uh, 2035. Uh, and sort of the initiation of commercial projects in the 2030 to 2035 uh, timeline. Uh, and so we see that moving from sort of uh, current stage of data gathering and uh, understanding the permitting and regulatory space to working through the permitting process for uh, demonstration projects uh, and then actually implementing pilot or demonstration projects while beginning that commercial permitting um, uh, timeline uh, for for commercial projects. Um, and we really see this these demonstration, like an early demonstration project is a critical uh, critical step to both prove out technology, uh, you know, cook and let's a challenging environment uh, physically with ice and sediment and um, and and uh, uh, seasonal, changes, I guess. And uh, and as I showed, there's a variety of technological approaches that could be successful. Uh, and so sort of de-risking that will be important. Uh, understanding the cost uh, and then, set, you know, developing the environmental monitoring protocols to ensure that sort of to de-risk the environmental side of a, a commercial project. Uh, so some of the recommendations, preliminary recommendations are identifying and filling these regulatory data gaps, getting the data that the regulatory agencies need to make their decisions and comply with the law. Um, uh, supporting adaptive management approaches. So in the areas where there just isn't the data to make a good decision up front, uh, coming up with a plan where you provide the correct instrumentation and real time observation and data collection to uh, be able to adapt your operation protocols in response to uh, any detected environmental impacts. Um, and then all of this is going to need investment in both the technology itself and in the workforce to develop and implement. Um, so it really is uh, pretty cutting edge stuff uh, 
compared to other options on the renewable energy side. Uh, and so one, one uh, opportunity that's on the table right now is uh, DOE is putting forward a $35 million opportunity to fund a uh, five-phased project to move towards a one to five megawatt pre-commercial title demonstration project. Uh, the proposals for this went out in July. Uh, decisions are expected in November, but uh, a number of proposals uh, focused on Cook Inlet. And so we're optimistic that at least one of the phase one uh, awards will include Cook Inlet in some way. So to summarize uh, tidal energy specifically, the my assessment is the resource is large and predictable. And so that uh, impacts you know, the storage requirements required per megawatt or per gigawatt of renewable generation capacity. Uh, but all of Alaska's waters are challenging, in particular Cook Inlet. Um, I would describe the technology as pre-commercial, but nearing commercial. So there are you know, megawatt or two megawatt or even three megawatt systems that are in the water operating in Europe uh, in particular. Uh, and so, you know, in the coming years, I think we're approaching where there are commercial companies that have products that they will sell you for a price uh, versus just being developed under, uh, you know, different types of government funding. Um, one of the big, uh, sorry, <clears throat> tickle on my nose. Uh, you know, one of the big hurdles is going to be the environmental impacts and and understanding those more fully. And I don't think that'll happen until there are turbines in the water in a, a demonstration uh, scenario. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks are thinking more broadly about tidal more than just, uh, you know, electricity to the grid, but also the potential to put, produce hydrogen or ammonia or methanol uh, either on the water for export or or on shore. Uh, and it looks like I still have some time. So I've got a little bit of uh, bonus content uh, just on hydrokinetics uh, in Alaska in general. And so uh, hydrokinetics are not new to Alaska. And uh, Jeremy, I'm sorry, I didn't update this slide after you corrected me. So this picture from Ruby is actually, I think, from 2008. Um, so 2008 to 2010 timeframe, uh, uh, I should say that Alaska has a, a fairly long history with hydrokinetics for riverine applications. And so uh, there were some early attempts in Ruby and Eagle to deploy vertical axis cross flow turbines from floating uh, uh, floating platforms. Uh, and they experienced pretty big problems with debris accumulation with trees in the water. And that was really the nexus for the formation of our uh, hydrokinetic research group at UAF here and our test site in Nanana. Uh, and then I think most folks are aware of the ORPC RibGen systems that have gone in in Agiagig over the last uh, several years. Um, and so uh, there's not much difference between riverine and tidal, except that the tidal current uh, changes direction several, you know, two to four times a day, uh, whereas the river flows a little more steadily in the same direction. Um, and so just just uh, for anyone who's not aware, our uh, Test site. So we have a riverine hydrokinetic test site at the, on the Tanana River in Nanana. Uh, it's an overhead shot. Uh, we have a debris diverter uh, for systems that we want to protect from debris. We have a 20 by 40 foot floating platform that we adapt to deploy turbines from. Uh, and then we have a uh, fishing system on the left that we collect uh, sample for fish behind the turbine and uh, report our findings to uh, fish and game. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm providing all of this for context that, you know, at the university, at UAF, we do have uh, a fair bit of institutional knowledge around hydrokinetic systems that we're hoping to apply uh, if and when activities uh, occur in Cook Inlet. So we have data collection capabilities, sonar, uh, ADCPs for measuring velocity, uh, sonars for mapping the, the bottom, the river or ocean bottom for bathymetry, uh, data loggers for characterizing turbine performance, both electrically and mechanically. Uh, and we have experience with kind of a wide variety of technologies. So on the left is a, the vertical axis crossflow turbine uh, with a log stuck in it. Uh, on the right is an uh, axial flow system from a company called Oceana that actually had an open center and an annular uh, bearing surface, uh, and I believe that was an attempt to get a high pole count generator built in and avoid the need for a gearbox. 
Uh, on the left is an oscillating system that actually uses vortex shedding rather than uh, rather than blades uh, producing lift. Uh, and the thought there was if you had a, a rugged system that was basically just a pipe in the water, so that silver D-shaped section pivots down into the water and the vortex shedding on it causes it to jump up and down, kind of like a power line in the wintertime uh, when it's got the snow on it. Uh, and could you harness energy that way uh, in a way that's low cost? Uh, and then on the right here is a system from a company called Blade Runner Energy, uh, and that you can see the rotor with the, the blades, uh, and it actually uses a flexible torque transmitting cable to connect it to a floating generator. Uh, and so we're pretty excited about this one for river applications. Uh, the turbine can deflect and translate around debris, and we haven't been able to get any debris to entangle with it. Uh, and your generator and all your electronics are above the water line in the housing. And so that flexible connection between the rotor and the generator uh, gives you that debris resilience uh, and avoids having to submerge your electronics. Um, and I think this is my last slide. Uh, there's a lot going on in the space, both the state and the federal level uh, with the Office of Energy Innovation, this task force and uh, the Sustainable Energy Conference and the proposed uh, funding to support uh, energy projects in the state. Uh, and then at the federal level, we've got the Arctic Energy Office engaged, um, national lab research programs focused on the Arctic, and uh, of course, the Water Power Technology Office supporting our work. So that's it. I think I'm ready for questions. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'll wait while folks put some questions in the Q&A box there. I will make a couple comments on your slides. You need to update the slide with me and Paul in there. Oh, Paul I didn't even know that was you. <laughs> yeah, Paul and I aren't that young anymore, and my beard is not that red. Yeah. <laughs> um, one question I had that while folks are thinking about their questions, on the you you laid out a timeline between now and twenty thirty five, I think. Um, it, it seems to me that the the I mean the technologies that we're seeing in Europe would actually fit in pretty well with that timeline. And then that makes me think in in that timeline, the biggest unknown is the permitting process. Um, yeah. Are there some, I mean, about how long did the permitting process take for Agiagic? And would that, you know, is that 10 year timeline or so, would it fit with, you know, your, your timeline? Yeah, uh, so I, I gotta say that Iggy Agig was before my time in the space, so I don't I don't have a good number off the top of my head, but I know that sort of the 10 year timeline is kind of accounted for in the plan. So the thought is that with the demonstration project, uh, you're utilizing the verdant exception, exception. So if you're below a certain threshold and you intend to be in the water for, I think it's less than 18 months, uh, there's a precedent for an expedited permitting timeline on the FERC side. And, uh, the hope is to use that as a pathway towards getting technology in the water and uh, establishing sort of the adaptive management procedures uh, and support that longer full commercial permitting timeline. Um, and uh, the feedback from the, at least the state regulatory uh, agencies on the, at least during the working group meetings is that, uh, you know, it's hard for them to comment on permitting timeline because they simply don't have the information they need to make uh, the decisions that are anticipated. And so we're trying to get out ahead of that as much as we can. Thanks, Ben. Um, we've got a question in the Q&A there on indication of the price ranges for some of these technologies on a kilowatt hour scale. And I'll, I'll hand that one to you, Ben. That one's a- Sure, sure. So um, it's really hard to get information out of developers about the actual cost per kilowatt hour. And uh, probably the most, uh, at least on the surf, or at least, you know, appearing the most honest uh, projections I've seen from, are from orbital uh, power. They're in Scotland. Uh, they have a floating system with two one megawatt turbines that drop down uh, from hydraulic arms on either side of a, a floating fuselage. And uh, off the top of my head, the, the LCOE plot they showed I thought they were somewhere in the 60 cent per kilowatt hour range now uh, with their current system. Uh, and I don't know what assumptions, if they're assuming, um, at, you know, at scale production cost or if they're actually using their real production costs for a one-off unit. But uh, they were, you know, 
charting a, a trajectory down to probably 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And so, um, you know, maybe it starts to look competitive. It's not anywhere close to what uh, wind is now, uh, but I don't know what uh, inflation or energy cost escalation assumptions are built into their projections and whether that is in, you know, current dollars or in, in future dollars. I don't recall off the top of my head. Thanks, Ben. Um, and this question here might be a question for Michelle and or Ben. Um, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Um, would title be a good fit for ba basically direct purchase of electrical energy from non-utilities? So like a PPA type arrangement? Yeah. So... Um, I think the, the questioner was thinking about, you know, large industrial clients, maybe data centers or something like that. Gotcha. I think that's all you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm really focused more on the bearings and seals and getting stuff to work in the water. Um, but uh, I would think it would boil down to like, yeah, are there applications that are happy to, to load follow uh, that tidal energy profile and sort of cut the storage requirement out of the mix. Um, I would think that would help your your LCOE um, if you don't have to do any load leveling. But I don't know, Luke, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, you know, I, honestly, I'm not as familiar with that system, um, so I I don't want to I don't want to speak off the cuff here if I, if I don't have a good answer. Well, I do feel like uh, I always have an opinion anyway. Um, you know, heating and vehicles it, electrified both have potentially approximately hours to days of storage inherent in them. And so something that was predictable and cyclical on that time scale year round seems like a pretty good match for those sorts of loads. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, looks like we're kind of wrapped up on the questions. Um, oh, actually, we've got one more. According to the DMV data we collect, uh, this is Alaska Energy Authority, uh, approximately 100 battery electric vehicles are in the interior as of July 2023. So that was answering an earlier question. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks, Audrey. Awesome. Okay, with that, we will uh, wrap up our, our talks for today. Uh, so thank you very much to our speakers. Um, as a reminder, the webinar recording and presentation slide decks will be posted on the AEA Alaska Energy Security Task Force website. And please join us next week for the seventh of the eight presentations um, for at Thursday, August 31st at 11 a.m. for the Emerging Technologies and Opportunities for Alaska Small-Scale Nuclear. We will see you next week. Thank you.